Yo, what's going on, everybody? How's everybody doing? JB here. I uh, just wanted to put together a quick little video on private VLANs. Some of you might not know what private VLANs are or why you might want to use them in your environment. So I thought it might be worth taking a little bit of time to kind of break them down and provide a little bit of background on what they are, the difference between them and regular VLANs, um, and then actually give you some different uh, configuration examples so that you can take those and go back and implement them in your environment. Now, if this is your first time uh, seeing one of my videos, first time on the channel, make sure you hit the, the like and subscribe and notification bell so you're always up to date on whenever I put out uh, new content. And I'm gonna go ahead and we'll just hop right into it. So let's start with what a regular VLAN is. And most of you, if you're here watching this video, you're probably familiar that it's just a, a logical way to group different uh, devices into their own virtual LAN. Um, it in essence creates a single broadcast domain that you can put all of those devices into. Um, there's nothing really fancy about those. Any device that resides within that uh, VLAN, as long as they're all on the same subnet, um, pretty much they're all gonna be able to talk to each other. So. Private VLANs take the segmentation that regular VLANs have with, you know, as I mentioned, the broadcast domain, but it allows you to further break those down and segment those into three different types. And those types are promiscuous, isolated, and community VLANs. And they all have various levels of protection profiles with those. So when you go to create a private VLAN, um, in essence, there's going to be a primary VLAN and a secondary VLAN associated with the, the private VLAN. So for example, as we move through the different diagrams that I'm about to show you, we're, we're using a certain layout here from a VLAN perspective. So VLAN 100 is always going to be the primary VLAN. And then we're gonna use VLAN 200, 300, and 400 as the secondary VLANs. The primary VLAN is your regular 802.1Q tagged VLAN, um, and all private VLAN ports have to be a member of it. The secondary portion of the VLANs um, is used to identify whether or not it's a community or isolated port. And I'm gonna go into the, the differences between those here in a second. So you heard me mention the three different types of private VLAN ports, promiscuous, community, and isolated. Promiscuous is just as it sounds. This is gonna always be associated with the primary VLAN. So in the case of the diagrams, we're gonna be going through VLAN 100. And a promiscuous port can communicate with all of the other ports in the private VLAN, including the secondary VLANs. So this is normally gonna be either a device that you need to communicate with everything else uh, in the VLAN, or it's going to be associated with the gateway device um, that's gonna be used for routing of traffic out of the VLAN. In the example in the diagrams that we're gonna be showing, VLAN 100 is going to be the promiscuous VLAN. Now the second type of port is community ports. And these are used to segment devices that you want to allow to communicate only with other devices in the same community. You can create multiple community subdomains in the same private VLAN, uh, but they'll only be able to communicate with other devices in that same secondary VLAN or uh, a promiscuous port. The third type of port is an isolated port, and that's when you wanna make sure that the device is not able to communicate with anything else in the VLAN except for the promiscuous ports. So, it will not be able to communicate with any other non-promiscuous ports. So an isolated VLAN, or a, I should say a device that's in the isolated VLAN cannot communicate with other devices that are in the isolated VLAN and they cannot communicate with devices that are in the community VLANs. So we're gonna look at a few examples of combinations of the, the stuff that I just mentioned. But as you can see in the first diagram here, this is just your standard VLAN configuration. All of the devices um, within this diagram are all in VLAN 100. They all can communicate with each other as long as there's no ACLs 
you know, in place on the switch or at the host level that would be blocking their communication. So the, the first real private VLAN configuration that we want to talk about um, is here in this diagram. And really it depicts, you have the overall primary VLAN is VLAN 100. You have one server, which is server A, is being promiscuous, which means it can talk to everything. And you have the gateway as being promiscuous. What's new in this diagram compared to the previous one is that we now have an isolated VLAN, which is associated with the secondary VLAN of VLAN 200. So in this specific scenario, server B and server C can only communicate with server A and the gateway. However, B and C cannot communicate with each other. In configuration number two, what we did was we swapped out the isolated uh, secondary VLAN for a community secondary VLAN, in this case, VLAN 300. In this scenario, server B and server C can again communicate with server A because it's promiscuous and can also communicate with the, the gateway uplink because that's promiscuous as well. Differing from the isolated configuration though, server B and server C can also communicate with each other. So in configuration three here, we take it a little bit step further than the configuration two. What we did was we add back in the secondary VLAN of 200, which was configured as an isolated VLAN. And this now consists of server D. In this particular scenario, server B, server C, and server D can all communicate with the promiscuous devices. So in this case, that would be server A and then the gateway uplink to the firewall again. Server B and server C can also communicate with each other, but can't communicate with server D. And server D is all left by itself can't communicate with anybody except for the particular ports that I already mentioned that were in promiscuous mode. This last configuration uh, builds on everything that we talked about up to this point, but then also adds in a second community group. And this time that community VLAN or the secondary community VLAN is VLAN 400 and consists of servers E and F. So again, in this situation, Server B, server C, server E, server F, and server D can all communicate with server A and vice versa, and can all communicate with the gateway uplink. Server B and server C can also communicate with each other, but no one else. Server E and server F can communicate with each other, but again, no one else outside of that community VLAN. And server D can't communicate with any of them except for the promiscuous ports again. Let's hop into what this configuration would look like. And the first thing we're gonna do is configure the VLANs. So VLAN 100, the name, and then we're gonna do a private VLAN primary. Okay. VLAN 200, name, server, and this was gonna be the isolated one. and then private VLAN isolated. Then VLAN 300. This was one of the community ones. And then we'll make that a private VLAN community. And then same thing with VLAN 400. So one last thing we want to do after we've already created uh, the four different uh, VLANs, the primary and the three secondaries, is we want to associate the VLAN 200, VLAN 300, and VLAN 400 with VLAN 100. So we'd go under VLAN 100, go private VLAN association, and we go 200, 300, 400. Okay. So now let's move on to actually configuring the interfaces uh, to get the correct uh, private VLANs put on them. So 
first off, let's go with uh, interface one, which will be the uplink to the firewall. This will be a promiscuous port. So we're gonna go switch port mode, private VLAN promiscuous. Then we're going to go ahead and add the mapping command to that. That's 100. And you'll see what the options are here. The secondary VLAN ID, so that's 200, 300, 400. Okay. Now let's go ahead and do uh, an interface for uh, the isolated VLAN. So we'll go interface FA2. And for here, we're gonna go switch port mode private, private VLAN host. And then it's switch port private VLAN host association. And that's going to be 100 and is the primary and then 200 is the isolated. Now let's move on to the community interfaces. We'll actually do both of these. We'll do it um, as a range command. And then uh, it's gonna be pretty much the same thing as what we did with isolated server so that's going to be switch port private vlan let's go with the switch port mode for switch port mode private private vlan host and then switch port private vlan host association this was going to be 100 as a primary and then 300 as the secondary and lastly we can do the same thing for the secondary um, community group. We'll just go five and six. And go group two. And again, switch port mode, private VLAN host, switch port. Private VLAN host association, 100 and 400. So now if we go and take a look at the running config, and there's also some other uh, private VLAN configurations that we can, or private VLAN commands that we can run to take a look at the configurations. So we can run the, the show run command and take a look. We see that we have our VLANs all here, 100, 200, 300, 400. 100 set up as a primary, the associations with two, three, and four. 200 set up as a isolated, three and four set up as community. And then, so the configurations on here aren't all the configurations that you'd wanna have on an interface. Obviously there's certain uh, other security configurations that you might want. We'll no shut the interfaces, probably put on some spanning three configurations, turn off CDP, all, all that type of stuff. But just to give you an idea of what the particular private VLAN configurations are, um, this kind of lays them out for you here. So uh, promiscuous port here, going to the firewall, um, the isolated server port. So with the host association and the private VLAN host, 
commands, same thing here. Um, I didn't make a interface for the other promiscuous firewall. Um, we could do that. I mean, in essence would be the uh, same thing as what the firewall uh, configuration or the firewall interface configuration would be. One other command that we can use to run show VLAN, private VLANs, that's going to break down um, which interfaces are in which uh, VLANs, both the primary and the secondary, and then give you the, the type of what the, uh, the secondary private VLANs are. Another command that you could run as well would be the same thing, but just a type. And that will just show you uh, the different private VLANs that you have and uh, which group they fall into. So that kind of covers what private VLANs are and the difference between them and regular VLANs. You have a lot more flexibility in the, the configurations and the controls uh, that you can put in place with them. Uh, we also went over uh, you know, different configurations that you could take and use and implement in your environment. Um, you might be wondering what are some reasons why you would want to use these in some specific scenarios. Um, one of the main ones that I always share with people is workstations. Workstations are devices that you really uh, don't need to have communicating with each other. Um, there's there's no real need for that to happen. Um, so if you implement private VLANs and put your workstations in the isolated VLAN, you're going to completely eliminate any type of lateral movement that might happen in your environment. Likewise, you could uh, take your different VLANs that have your different types of servers uh, in them uh, and determine which ones really need to talk to each other. Um, and if there are certain servers that might be in a VLAN but really don't need to communicate with other devices in that VLAN, go ahead and throw them in the in an isolated VLAN. Or if they only have to communicate with certain ones, um, you could go ahead and create uh, different community VLANs, um, and it will really help give you a, a better handle and control on the type of communication that's happening in your environment and can severely limit the ability for uh, lateral movement within your environment if uh, some of your devices, God forbid, actually become compromised or, or something like that. So it just provide you a, another layer of basic network security, which will make things a lot harder for uh, an attacker to do bad things in your environment. And it also makes things from a network hygiene perspective just be a little bit cleaner and uh, easier to manage. So uh, if you have any comments, make sure you drop them down below. Love to hear uh, some feedback on this video. And if you have any recommendations for future stuff you want me to do, please throw that down in the comments as well. Um, as always, make sure you hit the, the like, subscribe, and notification bell uh, because I'm trying to put out as much content as I can and you don't want to miss out on it. So uh, go get at it this next week and we'll talk soon. All right, take care. Mm -hmm.